Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the RGSQ's second uh, monthly lecture of the year. Uh, welcome to everybody. Um, we are recording this presentation, so if you could please keep your microphones and videos turned off during the presentation, that would be appreciated. Um, if you have questions, please uh, do uh, post them onto the chat. And uh, we will, um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, and uh, we'll certainly get to your questions and comments. So look forward to, your, um, to uh, participating by the chat function. So thank you. Um, so what this evening, our um, topic is mapping pest animals, identifying and managing impacts. I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Matthew Ryan. Um, thank you, Matthew, for presenting this for us this evening. Thank you. Matthew is a principal biosecurity officer with the Invasive Plants and Animals Program of the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Matthew has over 15 years experience managing pest plants and animals, born from interest when he was growing up on a sugarcane family farm in the Burdekin in Ayr, and working with specialized fields across local and state government. Matthew's current role has a focus on new and emerging plant and animal threats to Queensland and methods to both detect and prevent establishment of those pests. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Matthew to uh, present his, um, his lecture this evening. Thank you, Matthew. No, thank you, uh, Rafi Bay. Right, did that come up at all? Yes, it did. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. See it fine. Yes. No. Well. Okay. Thank you, Raphne. Um. Basically, uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide uh, an insight into uh, the department, particularly biosecurity Queensland, where we operate with the invasive uh, plants and animals space. So nothing that is domestic or owned by people. Um, what I'll probably, what I'll do tonight is just uh, provide a fairly broad insight into the operational application of mapping with pest animals and how we actually use maps uh, as a tool to um, illustrate problems as well as guide decision-making. So both with um, governments as well as landowners themselves. So one of the things is why maps? So like uh, Raffney was saying, I've had over 15 years experience in this field, uh, but with it, uh, this is both a regulatory and a pest surveillance field. So for the most of that time, I, I, I carry a GPS with me almost everywhere and there's very little in my working life that isn't recorded in, within some form uh, or another. So with mapping, we find that to be a variable powerful tool it records data. Uh, basically what we say is that uh, the job we're in, it's bigger than you. Who knows uh, about it when you go? So some of the, for example, some of the things I'm involved in is what we call proof of freedom. So we've undertaken treatment work um, of various pests within the state. And we return to those states just to ensure that we haven't had any new incursions of them and that we do have a degree of confidence that we have eradicated those. So with those proof of freedom um, programs, they're, they're mainly focused towards the plants uh, and that's predominantly because of the seed viability. Uh, an example of that is one site that I had a look at um, this year was inspected, uh, was re initially recorded on the 13th of February, 1953. So the, the person who originally recorded it, I consider they're long gone, not even sure whether they're still with us the property that I went to were quite amazed that we were still going to a site that old. Uh, as well as mapping, um, there's an adage around that you can't manage what you can't measure. So mapping does give you that ability to uh, put some parameters around measuring 
uh, what you're trying to achieve. And it can, overall, it can paint a picture which is relatable. So with a map, people can look at a map and they can understand that there's something happening in the landscape. They can identify with that landscape. They can identify that picture with that picture that you give them. They know where something is and they can see what it means, um, which sort of helps with getting your messaging across. So within our department, uh, one thing is uh, how we map. We plan a space where, MF, where there can be limited inf uh, information. Animals are transient because we're dealing with pest animals. They can be seasonal. They do not respect borders or land tenures. And they also, also some of the species we uh, pursue can be very cryptic in nature. This means uh, overall they're very difficult to map. Uh, and there may be different uh, information being captured. So with the pest area um, that I'm uh, part of uh, a, a number of years ago, they came up with what they call the spatial pest attribute standard or SPA, because we, even though it is a map, it is just basically a spatial database. And those dots on the screen generally have a multitude of information behind them. Uh, what the spatial, uh, the, the, that standards is, is that if you are going to map in the pest space, particularly whether pest animals or pest plants, there are attributes as a minimum, uh, we suggest that is recorded so that what can happen with that is that you can then go through, promote some consistency of the information that's being uh, given. And with that, if people have got the consistency, that can allow some data sharing as well as developing some universal formats with how this map um, is shared across. Uh, look, this was de uh, developed in recognition there was no guarantee of everyone collecting the same information uh, and the centralization of data can be problematic due to some uh, ownership that, that may be around that. With the pest mapping, uh, what do we map? Look, we're with the Department of uh, Agriculture and Fisheries, so we have a focus on agriculture and the pests, the invasive pests, which have impacts on agriculture. The pests that we do pursue also have uh, impacts on the environment, human health, and what they call social amenity or the ability to enjoy uh, recreational spaces. Uh, but we can quite easily manage their impacts uh, on the economy uh, purely through damage they do to crops, uh, infrastructure or, or stock, as well as the input of costs into undertaking management with them. As you can sort of see there, uh, what we sort of have is a, a bit of a hit list on who's doing the most damage out there. Surprisingly, with the amount of um, focus that are on foxes, they're doing quite the most, but you'll find people will focus on other things such as dogs uh, or feral cats or, or, or others, even though they are they are quite up there. So this um, table has been, it's, is a national table and it was developed by the Invasive Animals Cooperative. Uh, but one thing this doesn't take into consideration is the other impacts from pests, which may be stuff as uh, creation of dangerous driving conditions. So when you get into the large animals, feral goats, camels, pigs, uh, horses, etc., they can create road hazards as well as um, incur accidents and fatalities. Uh, some of them will have destruction of habitats and natural resources, as well as they will compete um, with native animals for, for food. So some of the simplest mapping that we sort of produce, uh, we undertake through what we call an annual pest distribution uh, survey. And that is, uh, they're publicly available maps on the DAF website. So these occur regularly every year we have a, um, we, we meet with small groups, um, predominantly local government, as well as state government officers. And we target uh, probably about uh, 20 or 30 of a list of about 100 every year. So they don't all get updated every year, but they do get updated uh, as regularly as we can. Uh, what, we, what we're sort of looking for is there is recording uh, of local pests. Uh, we need people with information and knowledge of uh, local pest locations, as well as knowledge of pest infestations uh, in those areas. This mapping is just some simple overview uh, information, just to give a broad snapshot of what's happening in the state. And it's basically through a distribution uh, versus a uh, population density. So with the distribution, it's quite 
simple, whether they're widespread throughout an area or whether they're localized, widespread being everywhere, localized meaning only being in specific locations. With the density, they are worse being the widespread and abundant. So an abundant density, which is the red area going right through to the localized and occasional densities of uh, animals, which is the light green. These grids that are on that map represent 17 by 17 kilometer uh, grids. And pure, that's sort of just to give broad overview as well as to uh, protect privacy information of um, property owners. Uh, where possible. So this map here is just predominantly of feral goats. Uh, and as expected, that's recorded more within the arid rural areas of Queensland. Although you will notice that the offshore islands do have uh, localised uh, populations of feral goats. And that's um, historic from the old um, tall ship days, just to ensure people at shipwreck have a food source if they were to become shipwrecked and go to one of those islands. Having said that, people decide whether an animal is a pest or not, and what a pest is to one person may be a valuable resource to another. So feral goats can be fickle when we map them uh, from time to time because it depends on drought conditions. During droughts, they're considered a co uh, commodity where land landowners will round them up and sell them, whereas in good seasons, they're just basically eating grass that their sheep could be eating. Uh, and this sort of leads on to with the mapping, uh, the, even though that uh, there, there does there is a bit of accuracy considered with this, there always is perceptions, and um, this sort of illustrates uh, people's perceptions. Is like, is that a lot of rabbits? To one person it may be, to another person it isn't. So, without the consistency, you are at the mercy of perceptions and basically people's attitudes and knowledge uh, of that infestation that they have. Uh, so our evidence tech is subjective and because of that, it will invite variation. So what the recorder is accustomed to and with that one there, that may be a lot of rabbits to someone. It may not be to um, another. Uh, one way of illustrating this is we have our pest distribution slide there on the left, the rabbit distribution that was undertaken in 2006. There have been previous ones, but this one um, has some evidence based mapping against it. Uh, on the left is the sit down talking to people of their knowledge of rabbit densities and locations and what the, they believe they should be. On the right is the rabbit suitability where they undertook uh, spotlight transects uh, of rabbits. So what the spotlight transects are is just driving along uh, designated routes, whether they be roads, etc., swinging a spotlight around, counting how many rabbits that you come across uh, per kilometre. Now what you can sort of see in there specifically is what I brought to attention is that you've got two areas there in the south um, west of uh, area of Queensland and towards the central. Both these areas talking to people they will tell you that they have rabbits, they're considered widespread uh, and they're, they're, but they're both considered occasional. So they're throughout the area but not really in large numbers. When you actually physically had people go out and measure them against a standard set of um, values, you can sort of see that in central Queensland there's very low numbers, but in that southwest corners the numbers are what you call extreme. So that, what I sort of, you, this is obviously a very broad brushstroke interpretation of just some visual information that a map can show you, but what it does demonstrate is that there can be a bit of variation uh, between people's perceptions uh, when you're recording uh, data. Another uh, area that we can uh, use mapping is beating some perceptions. So with this map here, this just map is just uh, illustrating some genetic traits of rabbit populations within and around the Darling Downs West Morton Rabbit Board area. I'm unsure whether you're familiar of the, the rabbit board, but the rabbit board basically is in that area which is sort of highlighted. That dark red line to the south is the actual rabbit proof fence which separates us predominantly from New South Wales. Uh, but that, that goes, runs from Mount Gipps near Rathdowney to Goombe between Chinchilla and Miles. It's approximately about 550 kilometres long. To the north, that line that you can see there, that's just an imaginary line. That's just the end of the jurisdiction of the Darling Downs West, West Morton Rabbit Board. So the board's role mainly is to maintain that uh, fence and rabbit proof condition and to monitor compliance. 
uh, with the management of rabbits in its areas. So within this map, we've got four distinct color, colors. And what that's sort of telling us is that there's four distinct genetic traits of rabbits uh, in this small area of Southeast Queensland. Now this genetic traits was taken from sampling and genetic tracing of rabbit samples that were submitted, so rabbits that were caught and samples taken generally an ear or some form of tissue was taken from them for the genetics. What that does show you, because the perception with the rabbit borders, the fence doesn't work. Because they have the fence there and they have rabbits further away, obviously the fence isn't stopping them. However, what the genetics suggest is that the rabbit populations to the north are not related to the rabbits that are along the fence. Now, as, as, long as, as well as long as with this is that, although this is genetic information, it just gives you that, we do have any anecdotal information that rabbits were moved from areas of Southern Victoria, et cetera, for game hunting and, um, and basically meat harvesting as well. So you can use maps to sort of help with your argument uh, if you're trying to prove that your management practices are working, as well as that you can use your evidence to sort of assist with, um, uh, in, if you're doing conservation, especially around the genetics of the dingo, which is, uh, is an iconic uh, Australian animal and it can raise great debate uh, in, in a myriad of circles. However, when you're looking at the protection of those uh, dingo genetics, you wanna be confident in what you're doing is actually protecting the genetics as opposed to um, just uh, allowing free roaming wild dog populations. So this mapping was undertaken from genetic testing uh, of tissues coming in from wild dogs and dingoes that were captured as part of manage management programs. And what it was sort of finding is that approximately about in Queensland, about 64, 65% of wild dogs in the environment, they're hybridized. So they're, they're a mix of a wild dog and a dingo, generally less than 50% of their genetics is dingo within them. Uh, what that does, uh, suggest with your management practices is that if you are undertaking management to protect dingo generics, you just need to be mindful of where you are and that if you are, are, are not taking out uh, wild dogs in that population, they may be contributing to um, over outbreeding the actual dingoes that we do have left. So that, that's just a, probably a very brief overview of what that map has shown us. There's the whole uh, paper that's dedicated to the information that was obtained uh, with that, that information. So what, uh, what we're actually looking for when we do map is that we are looking for evidence and what we're looking for is some uh, good evidence when we're using maps. So when we're sort of out there uh, looking for evidence, what we're collecting, we, we appreciate with these animals, you're not gonna see them you're not gonna accurately count them and you're not gonna accurately know how many are out there. Um, I've been involved with many uh, wild dog managements where I've been at uh, both ends of the scale where people have told me that um, there really isn't an issue. There may be only one or two dogs right through to we're seeing large numbers of dogs, 30 or 40 must be on this property. Uh, and with those, I've, I've tackled both extremes where people have only said they've seen one or two and we've pulled out uh, numbers you know, in excess of 35 dogs from a very small area. Other areas where they uh, believe that, that there's um, quite a number, uh, your evidence doesn't support that. And basically after about two or three dogs, there doesn't seem to be any sort of uh, evidence of any animals uh, post that until uh, any form of reinfestation. So. Irrespective, we're always looking for what we call tracks, gats and sign. So that's actual sightings of anything. And for this example, I'll probably stick to wild dogs, but it's the same for any animal, the actual animal itself. And that can be through visual sightings or the use of the trail cameras, which are quite uh, inexpensive and uh, a very good way of managing uh, recording uh, information, as well as measuring tracks that can be just undertaken through visual inspections of tracks or actually looking for tracks and counting those and uh, re uh, pre preparing an area where animals will tra uh, travel across. As well as that, we're looking for scats and droppings because that can tell you a myriad of things, the animal that you're after, uh, what it's been eating, uh, as well as other animals that may be in the area. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you may be able to find dens or harbridge and scratchings, territorial markings or sound. So again, with our wild dogs, um, that will be through uh, generally howling, which is a territorial behavior 
that they'll use. Uh, other forms of evidence we will look for will be uh, any impacts. So with the example using with the wild dogs, we'll use predation of both native and uh, stock as well. So where you're coming across carcasses, et cetera, you can have a look at those. Attacks on domestic animals. So wild dogs will attack domestic dogs, purely as a ter territorial thing. Was, as well as that, we can look at some behaviors, especially in domestic stock. Uh, you can lose, uh, stock can lose condition if they're constantly being chased or harassed by uh, wild animals or being out competed at food sources like um, feeding points or uh, watering holes with feral pigs. And they'll always be on the move. They'll be alert. They'll be easily spooked. They'll lose condition uh, as well as drops in stocking rates. So you might not be seeing as many young stock on the ground. So with this evidence that we get, you want to be applying this knowledge and it can be a little bit daunting to try and undertake control of invasive pest animals. And this can be influenced by sometimes the size or topography of the land that they manage. So what we do with um, any of our management, we try to uh, have people see that there's not always going to be uh, an eradication that, that may not necessarily be realistic. So the actual simple focus of killing animals shouldn't be the focus of any management. It should be understanding the problem and what you're out there to achieve. Uh, what this is, this is basically the, the curve, uh, invasion curve, basically showing the actions appropriate to each stage. So when you're into large numbers of animals, then they're occupying quite a large area. To think that you're gonna eradicate them, basically there, there's just no, there's no potential of that. Whereas if you were to sink your resources into protecting your assets, whether your assets be infrastructure, the environment or domestic, uh, there's more of a return on the dollars that you invest. So just a, a bit of a case study to have a look at this sort of thing. So this is this is loosely based on some case study or some real life things that I've been involved with. And one thing that you can sort of come across is, as I said, it can be a bit daunting with people sometimes and they can be under pressure from neighbours or others to undertake uh, management particularly on wild dogs, and I'll focus on wild dogs with this one. And this particular property here is a fictitious property. However, it's nearly 20,000 hectares in size with about 65 uh, kilometres of boundary. Now that's not uncom uncommon for central or western uh, stocking properties to be. And some of these are just have uh, land managers or caretakers that live on. So they're not actually the person who owns the property, but there are a there is a responsibility on that person there to undertake some form of management. One thing that we do do with these, we'll actually print out a map and we'll have what they call the old over the bonnet meeting with these people, where we'll just bring out a map of their property and we'll just go through it and it'll be just like the, the equivalent of a desktop um, troubleshooting of the problem that they have. So moving on with this particular property here, just to have a look at it, there's some features in the landscape that we would have interest in as, as a manager. Uh, undertaking some form of management. So there is a seasonal creek that goes through it. There is a rocky ridge to the northeast of the property, which is considered quite full of sharp rocks. Knowing wild dogs to be soft poured and a bit averse to walking on anything sharp, we're fairly confident that they're not gonna be um, comfortable in moving around that area. We also know that there's a bit of the old dog fence that was installed in the 50s or 60s, about 60, uh, a couple of kilometres of that running along a boundary there and maintained to a state which for this example is just stock proof, maybe dog proof in uh, some locations. Uh, as well as that outside the property and down to the southwest is a small wetland area. Uh, within that we know that there's a lot of small animals and some waterfowl as well as that there's some breeding of waterfowl um, going on. So we're quite confident that's going to be an area of interest for anything that's predatory in nature. When you speak to the property owners, uh, one of the things we sort of will ask them first up is like, um, what are you seeing? Are you sort of seeing any sort of uh, carcasses around the place or are you sort of hearing anything? And they'll gen generally they'll tell you straight up if they're hearing wild dogs. Uh, for this example here, they're hearing wild dogs howling in a little treed area. Uh, just south of the, the house on the property. And they have noticed some carcasses, whether they be waterfowl, wallabies, uh, bandicoots or stock 
have been killed in these areas around here uh, over the time. So these are just the impacts. And what we're doing with those impacts is with that person, we're recording them and we're recording where they are. As well as that, we wanna see any wild dog sightings that they may have. Uh, and with that, that'll be the tracks or actual animals. Over a period of time, for argument's sake, this plot property here has seen some tracks, regularly see some tracks around that treed area, obviously sees a bit of traffic going to and from the wetland area, as well as they will see from time to time, they might get a fleeting glimpse of um, wild dogs in those. So from that, we can sort of start building up more and more of a picture of where these animals are and um, provide some sort of information back to them from there. So with that information, we know some country that we're just gonna rule out because they're not seeing them, they're not moving them through there. And we seem to have a lot of activity occurring someone else, somewhere else. So basically from that, through a desktop, over the bond discussion with these people, we'll exclude that, that, that land and just take that out of the uh, picture that they don't have to actually work in there. So even though there is some, um, sightings of dog tracks along that creek bend along the eastern border, we won't discount it, but for the purposes of immediate management, we won't be doing anything further there because there's not a lot of things supporting it. What that does then does bring us down is just a small area for the initial concentration of management tools. And this is just came about from just simple interrogation of the evidence that someone supplied us and we've put on an overlay of a map. What that then does, is that just basically now decreases a 20,000 hectare property in just an area just over 300 hectares that you'd be looking at starting to wet your feet into undertaking some management. From there, you'll obviously review and go on, but at least you've got to start. It's far less daunting than the whole property. And it gives you something to um, sort of focus on and review to see how you progress. Now that's just some way that mapping sort of helps us with management. Uh, of pest animals and that can be applied across the, the principles of that can be applied across all the species. It's just wild dogs uh, are what we seem to focus uh, a lot on and uh, have a, bit, a fair bit of background with. Uh, the area that I sort of work in um, with the state level is we are more of a strategic prompt uh, response. And with that, we're in that prevention space. So it's just basically a pro protection um, of the state against what is not here. So the rates of incursions of things are increasing and that's basically associated with the growth of international trade and travel, uh, which leads to the importation, whether intentionally or accidentally, uh, of thousands of uh, invasive weeds, pest animals and diseases. So we are under a constant um, threat of attack from these things uh, coming in from a multitude of um, entry points. Uh, some of the problems of the invasive species has also been exacerbated by the ability of people to trade over the internet. So the internet has opened up the ability of people to get things that they want a lot quicker, even things that they um, weren't probably aware of before, they have a, a lot quicker um, access to it. There's, a, there's a, a number of things which Things are measured against for their risk of incursion, uh, and they can general uh, they can be generalised into uh, a couple, being their probability of escaping. So whether that's escaping activity or hitchhiking across, it's just basically how they're going to entry. Their probability of harm, and that harm may be an economic harm, so it could be just a cost to an industry or the public as well as it could be a harm to the environment, sometimes even harm to human health, as well as harm to social amenity or people's access to enjoy uh, the environment or, or where they live. There's also a probability of establishment uh, and there's a number of, of factors which can in, um, uh, be assessed with that pro probability of establishment. One of those though that we focus on is climatic conditions and mapping can play a major role in um, giving us an, a, a, a reference point for something establishing. So getting, actually getting on and, and living successfully in our environment. As well as that with our prevention, there's a probability of eradication or how easy it is to find these things and how easy it is to control populations or individuals to get them out. 
Uh, I've got a map of Florida there. So we're quite fortunate in Queensland that with Florida, we sort of use Florida as a bit of a hard and fast tool of comparing what, um, what is happening in Florida and what may happen here. Florida basically has a similar land use to us. So through its uh, residential and uh, primary productions, it's, it's similar. Uh, it has similar demographics in society as us, and it has a very similar climate range. Uh, the difference between us and Florida is America, United States is less regulated than us, uh, especially with the domestic animal industry. And this area also has, uh, acts, um, has a lot of established uh, invasive uh, pest species in it, both plant and animals. Uh, one piece of literature that we do refer to a fair bit with our risk assessment in Biosecurity Queensland is what's uh, a, a piece of literature called the runaway, a runaway train in the making. It's the exotic amphibians, reptiles, turtles and crocodilians of Florida by W.E. Uh, Mashaka Jr. And basically is the train wreck, which is Florida of the escaped, especially of the reptile species, how they've escaped and overtaken the native environment and changed it uh, in Florida. So back to that focusing on the probability of establishment. Um, one of the things we do use with assessing that incursion, uh, some, we can range from some very simple query tools and you can take that up to some very, uh, to more extreme complex algorithms. So when you get into areas of uh, where you're really justifying spending uh, large bu budgets, you need a lot more evidence behind you, but with some just some quick queries, there is some software that's freely and publicly available on that we will refer to, uh, one of those being um, Climatch software. And uh, Climatch software sort of assists us with prevention and it can just paint a quite an easy picture straight up of how bad something could be. So this example here is the American corn snake done through uh, the Climatch software. And Climatch basically rates areas from zero to 10, zero being dark blue and unsuitable. So this, this animal's not gonna like being there, right through to 10, which is like a reddish brown and being an ideal climate range. So your yellows, uh, your yellows, reds and browns are the areas where something is most likely going to be, whereas your blues is where it's probably not going to like and may not uh, even survive. So the American corn snake for a bit of background is, widely, is the most, one of the most widely traded uh, pets internationally. And, it's, and this is because it's quite easy to handle and it is, um, comes in a, in a variety of patterns and colors, which make it quite uh, pretty. Uh, so with that, they are prohibited to own or sell in Australia, including Queensland. But uh, with them, we do know that people do possess them unlawfully. And there are occasional sightings of these, whether they've been escaped or whether they've been dumped. Uh, so some of these animals also have been seized as part of investigative inquiries with offences that we pursue uh, under the Biosecurity Act. So this species also has been recorded with accidental transportation or hitchhiker incidents. So what we call hitchhiker incidents are those where the animal has gone into freight, predominantly shipping containers, and um, have come out of a shipping container when it's been opened up uh, over here. The thing with reptiles is they can survive a long time uh, without having a feed or a drink, so they can survive those sea crossings. What this climate uh, modeling here, what this map is suggesting is that the American corn snake is well suited to the eastern areas of Queensland, as well as the wider range within Southeast Queensland and Central Queensland. This not only illustrates the species of potential established, but allows an educated guess on where we should be spending our resources with any surveillance efforts uh, that we wanna focus uh, Unfortunately, this modeling is also consistent with areas of higher human populations and freight importation. So by probability, this is the area where both hitchhiker incidents and illegal trade in the species is likely to occur. So it's just unfortunate that they map, map, map up. So there is probably a, a higher probability of escape and a higher probability of establishment with this one. What this sort of will tell us is that we need to focus our resources into intelligence gathering and regulation activities with inspectors either located or having rapid access to these regional centers so that we can uh, respond to things quickly or uh, build up a picture of what's happening out there and try and uh, continue with the, the exclusion of those. Uh, so 
What we can also do with our prevention is like I sort of said before, there is that probability of escape harm as well as eradication. And just for a bit of fun, just to show the other side, how you can exclude things uh, without getting uh, too specific. You can have a look at something such as uh, the Highland Manor, the S. nullius. And this thing exists in hierarchical herds, breeds readily, degrades the landscape, causing erosion, destroys crops and infrastructure, highly territorial and will attack, potential for human fatalities. So what this has as potential uh, pest impacts is this telling it, it is very, very bad. What you can do though is quickly uh, exclude it using some of your climate modeling. And what that modeling will tell you is taking it from a native range, is it bringing back there to the blue areas? Is it's just telling you that the ranges of these is gonna be very limited, especially in Queensland. What that sort of means to us under a technical assessment is that the areas where this thing's gonna establish is gonna be in Tasmania and uh, Southern uh, Victoria. So essentially who cares with that? So I think uh, that's probably just a, a quick sort of brief overview on what we sort of do. Uh, and just to summarize with that, it's just the take home message with this is feral animals can be difficult to manage and require a lot of resources and technical expertise, but mapping can provide us with a rapid understanding of a situation and specific circumstances. Uh, it can also remove a lot of the guesswork with us and uh, help inform decisions to both um, policy makers, legislation, as well as landowners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so, I mean, uh, as a geographical society, many of us are always trying to convince people of the value of maps. <laughs> And uh, it's a real treat to have a presentation which focuses on the value of maps and the application of a very important um, area of work like yours is. So thank you. Uh, in the audience, we have a number of um, our members who are uh, members of our, we have a, a very active MAC group, uh, a special interest group in the society number of the members um, here tonight in the audience are from our MAC group. So I'm sure they've appreciated uh, very much, but in a different area from, from what we've heard before. So we'll, we'll go to some questions, but uh, I might start the ball rolling uh, with one question, very general, um, while people are thinking about some, some more questions to put to you. Mm -hmm. What do you consider to be the most problematic feral pest species in Queensland today? I, probably the, one of the most problematic that we do have in managing would be the feral deer species. Uh, and, and that is purely because of uh, people's perceptions of the animal. Uh, and that can be sometimes linked back through what they call the Bambi um, image of them. Uh, and that uh, people can associate with them and they can, with that association, they can put ideals on these animals uh, where it's sort of, they'll lean more towards protecting them as opposed to trying to have any manage, uh, trying to manage them. So I think as well as that in Australia, we're probably unfortunate that we don't have any large native animals like a uh, red kangaroo can get quite large, but we're not like the Americas or Europe with their large native deer and moose, etc., cetera, where uh, once you start encountering these animals and they do take life through vehicle accidents, uh, they can be territorial in which they will attack stock, they will attack horse riders, uh, that sort of thing. It can be very difficult for governments to persuade management of these species uh, where there's that um, perception that they're just, they're harmless and they're cute. So I think that's probably the, the, the main problem that we do face. Whereas with, with wild dogs, uh, we generally find people say, if it's not a dingo, they're quite happy for us to do something about it, so. Mm. Okay, that's a bit of a surprise. It what the deer weren't, deer wasn't on your list of, you know, Australian 
tests before the one of the very early slides that you can... no no because uh, the, the, with the deer they, they do have some impacts and um we're fortunate now there was one of the main ranges for the king's national park the very first national park in australia in sydney he undertook management of deer through there over probably two decades and he gives a very good talk on the insights in managing the community and managing the expectations uh, as opposed to just managing deer. He actually said managing deer is quite easy. The tools that you use to apply to reduce the population, the majority of your work is in actually managing the uh, community. Mm. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll move on to some comments and questions from the audience. First of all, uh, Stephen commented early on, I'm extremely surprised at the minimal cost impact of camels. That was from that same table. Fascinating. Um, would you like to make a comment about camels? Oh, I wouldn't be able to provide specific information with the camels. It's just purely because the camels are in the more arid areas of um, Australia. Uh, and with that, they're within their small groups. Uh, as I sort of sort of hinted a bit with uh, feral goats, this does come into consideration with feral pigs and feral camels. Camels can have can be a commodity under certain um, circumstances, climatic circumstances such as drought, where people will see them as a revenue source and protect them. Uh, when you get into better conditions where they just see these things eating the grass that the cattle would be eating, they then become this uh, highly invasive pest that something should be done about. So camels, as well as a few of our other pests, can change from time to time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then a question from Stephen came next. What about domestic invasive pest species? For example, you mentioned the American corn snake. A popular Australian domestic pet snake is the Stimpson's Desert Python. Yep. A popular domestic amphibian is the Murray short neck turtle. Is prevention mapping undertaken of domestic species? Okay, with um, the department that I'm in, uh, there is that jurisdictional crossover. Although we work, work in quite closely with the Department of Environment and Science, basically the cutoff is that we do exotics, they do natives. So I'm unsure of what they do in that um, space, but I do know that they do uh, some uh, information around those animals uh, and that's associated with their palm, their permits and licensing management. So I have no information on that purely because I focus on things that aren't native, whereas they do. So what was the department you said? It was the Department of Environment and Science is who they are now. So yeah. 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 Right. Okay. A uh, question from John. Do you have any publicly available resources where we can see the distribution of problem species, animal and plant in Queensland? Okay. Available? Yeah, the, we have that and those maps that I brought up very at the very start as part of our annual pest distribution survey, and that's a um, the aim of those maps is to bring uh, publicly available records of broad mapping of invasive species. On those pages there, there is a link on the Department of Agriculture website, and there's over a hundred species uh, that we do map. Um, there's annuals surveys which are done and, that, and that's done with um, where we sit down and talk to particularly local government offices and other state. We'll even talk to the Department of Environment and Science because they have the national parks under their jurisdiction as well where they'll provide information on the abundance and density of um, those pests but those maps are available both uh, on the 17 by 17 grid um, downloadable PDFs uh, overviews on our website, but I do believe that QSpatial has downloadable um, uh, GIS files, which you can then put onto your, if you have compatible mapping systems software to upload those files on to interrogate the data a bit more. So it sounds like there are quite a lot of publicly available resources from your yes. department. Yes, environment, right. science, and yep. yes, and yep. yep, thank you. Uh, from David, 
do you cover small animals like house gecko and fire ants? Do you cover plant <laughs> pests? Yes, I, I cover plant pests. Uh, things like house geckos, no, uh, they're quite widely established uh, beyond the realm of containment or, um, or eradication. Uh, and fire ants is a specific program within our department. And the reason that it is specific is that it comes under what they call a national cost shared agreement. So where the other states and territories contribute to that program. And as such, it's controlled at arm's length and independent of the area that I work in purely because they've got uh, their uh, fundees, which they have to report back to. But yes, we generally do, we, we are within the um, exotic plant and exotic uh, animal space. It's often hard to know. I mean, we, we see a lot of geckos, cats geckos. Are they the Asian ones or are they native? Generally they're the Asian. <laughs> Definitely the Asians, yes. Um, Kath comments, uh, it was, I think you mentioned the park, first national yep. park was Royal National Park. Royal yes. National Park, yes. Yeah, yeah, I always get that one mixed up. But yeah, Royal <laughs> National Park, it's the first one that, that was yeah. there. So. Sure. Um, question from Neil. What can be done with feral animals in the wider area of Cape York? I have seen them increase over recent years, especially wild pigs. Okay, so with um, uh, a number of those, it, it, there, there are from time to time funding initiatives which go through. Uh, and with those, because with the landscape that you're up against, that's what poses your biggest problem is uh, the amount of country that you've got to get. The access to that country is can be absent in most cases. Uh, and uh, it's just a matter of what tools you can get in. Uh, and because they, they are expensive, so how long that you can maintain using those tools. So I do know in those sort of areas there, they will go to more of the aerial shooting platforms purely because they can uh, dramatically reduce numbers very, very quickly in areas that are that are isolated. So it, um, th there are programs up there. And I think the, some of the, a lot of the focus now is actually the encouragement of um, joint management with the Indigenous, uh, the traditional landowners up there, as well as um, Indigenous ranger programs. Very, very um, difficult area, I think. Cape York is a very large and difficult well, access. Like, I think even like at, at this point in time can uh, demonstrate as well is that you need to pull all your resources out if you've got a cyclone purely from human safety. Oh, so okay. sure. so you, can, you, you can lose six months of the year mm. with any program up there. You're just going to have to postpone it. And just because you're not there doesn't mean the animals are going to stop breeding and wait for you to come back. So they'll cyclone. keep going. <laughs> cyclone up there right now. So yes. <laughs> something's yep. going on. Um, Stephen has an interesting comment here. I apologise on behalf of my family for my uncle, who used to own a shack at ERA, E-R-A, and loved feeding the deer that visited his doorstep in the Royal National Park. He may have been one of the hardest to convince people about issues associated with deer in the bush. What a knowledgeable presenter. Thank you. That's to you, Matthew. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then a question from John again. Do you have a cost list for plants similar to the animal table you showed at the beginning of the talk? I think, you know, estimates of damage. Yeah, there, there will be estimates of damage. Um, offhand, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put my hand on something to give you straight away, uh, but there, there are assessments of plants. Uh, and some of those will be down to specific plants because I, I know that um, with some of them, we'll actually estimate uh, uh, the impacts to an industry such as agriculture. And that estimation is what we go forward with when we seek uh, to implement a program and, and as such budget to undertake work to try and eradicate something when it's on that smaller end. But um, there would be estimates for uh, the plants, uh, how specific that is, I'm unsure whether you get something broad, but there, 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 are, there is information there. Mm, okay, good. Thank you. Right. Now, does anyone else have a question they'd like to post on chat? Um, again, while perhaps some more people are thinking, I may um, just um, ask one more general question. Yep. 
Um, do you see any options for citizen science participation in this field in helping to um, map and eradicate some feral pests? Yes, for sure. See, the, 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 the problem we always find in, in, in governments is that there's less and less of us and there's more and more to do. Uh, with that, that, that takes you away from um, some of your, your basic information and evidence gathering. So with the citizen science is that we're, we're becoming more and more reliant and not so much becoming more and more reliant. We're actually identifying that that is a bona fide way of um, obtaining information and evidence. Uh, as we sort of said with the spatial attribute standard, we recognise that there was a lot of organisations recording information and they're recording it a bit ad hoc. And it, if you're getting garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So one thing that the national body for um, uh, research in animals, the, in, the invasive animals CRC, which is the cooperative, they developed an app because apps are all the rage now because you can have them on your smartphone, uh, called Feral Scan. So this is one of the, the leading apps at the moment where people can just download the app, they log on it and they can record specific information of what particular evidence they are looking at regardless of what um, pest animal species uh, that it is. That all, obviously all comes back to a centrally managed database and as what I've sort of find with my job is though, even though I never really seem to use any information I record, somewhere, somehow, someone will. So even though you've only got a little bit now, it might be a little bit of the puzzle which will be built up over the years, even decades, that someone will interrogate later on. Uh, so, and I think with these um, apps available to just the general public, you're basically getting an increase of information. And uh, if just to preempt any questions, there are apps for weeds as well. Mm. Um, Matthew, would you be able to email Lilia um, the links to those apps? Or yeah, just... yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll email the links to uh, Feral Scan. Uh, okay. Look, I'll email the link to Climax as well. That's, a, that's an agricultural mm. Um, mm. thing. And it's taken from a number of weather stations around the place. And like you can see, you had a bit of fun. You can find something like in the highlands of Scotland. It's not going to ha happen here. But when you start getting into the native ranges, there's something that may be a little bit a bit of pest potential about it, you can quickly see what impact it's going to be for Queensland or Australia. Yeah, if you can email those links to Lilia, I think we, we would like to put them up on the web, our society web or somewhere appropriate so that people yeah. can access them if they wish. Um, okay, a good news story here, positive comment from Helen. I member of IGSQ, I was involved a few years ago in the hunting for cane toads on Morton Island. We brought in a sniffer dog and teamed with the Frog Society who know the difference in calls of frog and toad. Uh, Brisbane City Council has taken over the work now so that Morton Island is the only cane toad free Island in Morton Bay. Well, that, that's, that's a great story, <laughs> good news story. Um, okay, another question here, a comment from Stephen again. A bit of an esoteric comment or question. I noticed in your presentation similarity between perceptions of pest species invasion and reality. The same is often the case with crime data. People think it happens more in their area or less than is reality. So opinion becomes prevailing thought, whereas reality can be different. Is there an influencing approach as well as a data approach to help change people's minds? I know this is happening in the crime space, but is it happening in invasive species space? Bit of a complex uh, question there, Matthew. But do you yeah. get the point? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I think that's that's a it's a it's a good question to have. Um, I th I probably have touched on it very broadly, especially with the wild dog mapping. Um, people have this perception because they see uh, a wild dog and it's very dingo-like in its looks. It's the right colour, um, has the white socks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you get down to the genetics of it. Um, like that mapping was sort of showing, that's, that's actual genetics from captured animals. It's showing that there's, there's just no uh, very, very low levels within it. Uh, although it's very hard to change the Facebook perception of something, 
Uh, with government, we don't like to get into that social media space and let that run its course and just deal with what evidence we can get. Um, I think like with that, the rabbit one showed you where people think there's a lot of rabbits in that. It's up to, I suppose, it, it, there is a responsibility on government there to ensure that any information we do record is publicly available. The method that it has been recorded is uh, open and transparent so people can interrogate what we do and how we do it. And that so that when we do present our evidence and why we do certain things, we're backed up. Uh, it, those perceptions will always be there, but if you bring your evidence to the argument, at least that's something you can fall back onto. And I think that's that's why our mapping is publicly available. We're not we're not here to hide anything. This is what we know, and this is how we know it. Yep. Good. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Matthew? It's uh, now eight thirty. So um, what I might do now is a round of thanks for Matthew. If everybody would like to turn on their mute, uh, turn on their microphones, I should say, and, um, uh, you know, we'll give Matthew a round of applause. And if you wish, turn on your video as well. So everybody there? Where's the video? I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, people are putting on their microphones now and um, see we are. and uh, videos, there they put all are. Head, put your head over. <laughs> Away. I think we, we had about 30 people um, listening That's to the talk. <laughs> so thank you again and a big round of applause. Thank you, thank Matthew, you. for a very fascinating thank talk. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. Um, and I hope you do uh, continue to enjoy our Zoom lectures. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll be looking to possibly go back to some in-person presentations uh, this year. Not quite sure when we will do that and resume that again. But if that's the case, um, we do have the facility now in the society's premises to um, Zoom as well. So we're hoping to do both, have it in person perhaps with a presenter, but also um, relay it via Zoom to particularly our members outside of Brisbane who can't always attend, obviously. So thank you again, everybody, for this evening, for coming this evening. And thank you again to Matthew for a very fascinating talk. Thanks, Rafi. All the best, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. 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 Thank you.